Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching Tesla Time News. Episode 257 on Now You Know. We're brought to you by our amazing Patreon patrons. You can support creating independent news every week by heading over to patreon.com slash now you know, and there you'll find some awesome perks. And one of those perks is at the $8 a month level, we have a monthly live stream with Zach and Jesse. Our next live stream is happening Saturday, August 14th, so be sure to join us for that. And we're brought to you by BigBattery.com. No matter what you need to power, Big Battery can provide you with the latest battery tech at the best price per kilowatt hour guaranteed. Their batteries are easily installed, require zero maintenance, and they're made right here in the U.S. Pick up yours today at BigBattery.com and use code NOWYOUKNOW for 5% off at checkout. This week's episode is sponsored by Blinkist. We were blinking today, in fact. Yeah, a blink is like a condensed version of a book, the pure essence, if you will. Blinkist has over 3,000 nonfiction books available. We blinked The Brain, The Story of You by David Eagleman. And if you're wondering how we both blinked it, you can either read your blinks or listen podcast style with their apps. So we listen together during lunch. It's a cool way to learn new stuff in a way that I don't think was ever possible. Right. I mean, there are audiobooks, but those take hours. Blinks take about 15 minutes. So a few minutes later, you have all the basic takeaways from a book that would normally have taken hours or days to get through. And we're not the only ones. Blinkist has 14 million active users. And if you like audiobooks, and who doesn't, Blinkist also has full-length audiobooks with premium subscribers getting special member pricing up to 65% off the regular retail price. And Blinkist now has short Shortcasts. They've teamed up with popular podcast creators to blink those for you too, so you can get to the heart of a podcast episode fast. The first 100 people who use our link are going to get unlimited access for one week to try out Blinkist. You'll also get 25% off if you want to try the full membership. And the seven-day trial is completely free. You can cancel at any time during that period. So Tesla increased the price of the Model S again this week, raising it $5,000. Didn't we already report on this like a couple weeks ago? Yeah, we reported on the previous price increase, but this is another one. The price on a long-range Model S stands at $89,900, almost $90,000 now. Well, but I mean, less than a month ago, it was just about $80,000. So does this new price affect people who already ordered um, but haven't taken delivery yet? No, this just affects people who haven't ordered yet. So why is Tesla doing this? Well, deliveries aren't expected until March or April of next year. I think there's a lot of pent up demand for the Model S after the rumors of a refresh circled around 2019. A lot of people were just waiting on the sidelines. So I think Tesla is saying here, you want a Model S? So does everyone else. And I mean, unlike back in, say, 2015 or 2017, if you want a cheaper car, you can just get a Model 3. Yeah. Well, if you can't afford the Model S after the price increase, there's a good chance you'll be able to afford a Nissan Leaf. Nissan just slashed prices last week for the 2022 Leafs, and the difference is staggering. The cheapest Leaf now goes for just $27,400. That's before incentives, which you can still get the federal tax credit for the full $7,500 tax credit, which brings the price to $19,900 after the federal incentives, but before any state or local incentives. Yeah, I mean, that's a really cheap price for a new car. But let's just point out this chart here because mm-hmm. uh, not all leaves are the same. Right. Uh, that price you were talking about is for the 40 kilowatt hour leaf, the, the lowest range, which has a range of what? About 150 miles. Okay, so, so better than old, old leaves, but not like staggeringly great range. Yeah. There's also the 62 kilowatt hour leaf. That is a starting price of 32.4, which is still pretty great. And that's before all the incentives. So you could get it for like, I don't know, uh, $23,000, $24,000, something like that with incentives. Right. It's an excellent price. Um, again, 226 miles isn't the biggest range in the world. There's also uh, limited charging options, especially if you're going long distance and you want fast charging. Chademo stations, even at Electrify America, hard to come by. There's usually maybe one Ch- Chatamo station. Also, Rapidgate. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, remind it, everyone about Rapidgate. So, uh, you know. There's a lot of gates nowadays. <laughs> this generation of the Leaf came out. It was supposed to uh, be able to fast charge a lot quicker at a Chatamo station. And, what and it, it could. And it could once in a particular road trip because basically the battery would heat up because it's passively cooled. There's no liquid cooling in right. the battery. The battery would heat up. You'd have charged up. Oh, this is great. You'd drive a long way. You'd get to the next charger. 
and it would charge very slowly because it had to protect the battery pack. Uh, Nissan said that they fixed this. People have been testing it. They haven't really fixed it that much. So it's not the best long range car. But again, if this is your daily driver commuting to work for the standard American, it's pretty good. But I do want to point out with this lowering of pricing, that lowers the resale value of even new Nissan Leafs that they bought last year. Right. Yeah. I mean, Leaf prices do generally drop quite a bit as soon as you drive them off the lot. Right. And this is probably just going to exacerbate that. Right. So there's been a lot of talk in the last week about Tesla using Blade batteries. Blade bat like the movie Blade? <laughs> no. These are those long, flat LFP cells uh, made by BYD that would fit snugly next to each other in structural packs. BYD announced the Blade battery last year. And Tesla is going to be using Blade batteries? Well, hold on. Uh, here is all that we know. Chinese media CLS reported on Thursday, and now this is translated, so to keep that in mind. The Financial Associated Press, August 5th, the reporter learned from a number of people familiar with the matter that BYD is about to supply Tesla with Blade batteries in the second quarter of next year. The Tesla models currently equipped with Blade batteries have entered the C sample test phase. In this regard, BYD said it does not comment. Zhu Hao is the reporter from the Associated Press. So that is all the info that anyone has to go on. But of course, people are speculating like crazy. Oh, I know this is going to be they're going to go in the twenty five thousand dollar Tesla. What? Yeah, hit the like button and I'll tell you. Uh, it'll really help share this with more people. Okay, I'll hit the like button. All right, thank you. So yeah, you don't remember this from Battery Day? Tesla's gonna make a $25,000 car using LFP batteries. This is probably the car that they were talking about. No, I remember that, but I mean, have they even started working on this fabled car yet? Yes. yes. Last summer, Tesla took design submissions for its Chinese-made small EV and they even hired people last year. But that doesn't mean they're making it, right? Well, Ray for Tesla reported to the Twitter cube, quote, the elusive cheaper compact model whatever may come sooner than you think. The prototype is said to have been completed and most component suppliers have been lined up. Trial production has been planned for the end of 2021. Now, that wasn't the exact translation that I got from my phone, which was model next gen is not a smoke bomb. Most of the suppliers have been negotiated and it will be small scale by the end of the year, but it is not disclosed. I don't even... That's Google Translate for you from Chinese. So thank you, Ray, for Tesla for kind of breaking it down into... Because I think that most people wouldn't... You know, it, it's not a smoke bomb. Ray went on to say, I would put some weight on this rumor as it comes from a pretty reliable source. The source is called Not Zhang Zhaokang. Um, he brought several leaks to the surface before, which later turned out to be true. However, like anything else, past performance is no guarantee of future results. Take it with a grain of salt. All right. So in a single year, Tesla went from accepting design submissions to a completed prototype. I mean, and they'll have it ready to start production by the end of this year. Yeah. Why not? Well, because the Model 3 began design in 2013 and it wasn't even unveiled until 2016 and wasn't even produced until the last half of 2017. But they were kind of also planning on the Model Y, which could have slowed down development. Plus, Tesla was a much smaller company back then, and this should be a much smaller and less complex car. Plus, you saw how fast Giga Shanghai was built and continues to grow. Uh, I mean, maybe they did it. I mean, this is all a bunch of speculation based on two unsubstantiated rumors, so don't get your hopes up. But I mean, I think that it is possible for Tesla to make a $25,000 car. Sure. I mean, uh, as we've just recently seen, we've been testing out the ID4 and there's a bunch of components that are really nice in the Model 3 that, you, you know, you might just not imagine because it was supposed to be this, you know, cheapified car, but they really didn't skimp out on a lot of things. And I think there, there's some stuff where they can make it just marginally worse and save a ton of money. Also, with Tesla, they could just take um, what they already have and use it in this Model 2, as opposed to, you know, just constantly iterating like they do for all their cars. So in a way, they don't even have to like dumb down the car. They could just put out a Model 3, basically. And then the Model 3 will continue to move past it. And this will become, you know, the Model 2. And there's been some other speculation that maybe they could just mega cast the whole thing. Right. I mean, just have it be like a uh, like a die cast car, like a like a Hot Wheels. Now, I don't think you can make a cast the entire uh, piece of the car. I think you still need to do the front and the back. But this blade battery is structural. So, I mean, it could be. I don't know. There's 
There's a lot of uh, a lot of questions here. It uh, would be cool. They have patents for it, and the people working on these mega castings now are the lead experts in the world of casting cars. No, so. I hear you. I mean, just imagine if this is true. Imagine if a Model Two comes out at the end of this year, which is literally almost here. Uh, that would be groundbreaking news. I mean, that would be an, just another sea change. Right. Now, we did put it to our patrons over on Patreon, um, and we're going to re be reporting on that later on in the show, so stick around for that. Because they're always right. So we've been covering the ongoing story of Chevy Bolt's spontaneously catching fire due to two manufacturing defects in the LG-made battery cells. We reported recently how Chevy is issuing a third recall on 2017 through 19 bolts. This involves checking battery packs and replacing defective packs or modules. Now, that sounds kind of expensive. Oh, it is. According to GM's Q2 filing, they spent $1.3 billion on all recalls during the quarter, with $800 million of that alone just for bolt recalls. Wow. The bold recalls single-handedly reduced GM's profit by nearly 30%. Wow. And we don't even know if it's over yet. I mean, we don't know how many bolts were fixed this quarter. There's a good chance that we could be seeing more costs next quarter. And I'm sorry, I just want to make a side note here. As we've been researching all these bolt fires and the whole recall, I came across that U.S. News bestowed the Chevy Bolt with the Best Electric Vehicle Award for 2021. Now, putting the fires and the recall aside, um, what? Yeah, the Chevy Bolt is not the best EV of 2021, not by a long shot. It might be a great value or maybe get the good result for not trying hard award, but under no circumstances is it the best EV. Now, I know that I'm biased, but uh, Zach and I test every EV we can get our hands on, and the Bolt is not even in the same league as any of the Teslas, if you know what you're talking about. So please, mass media news organizations, stop giving awards for things you obviously know nothing about. It just hurts your reputation. All right, there is so much going on right now with SpaceX and Starbase this week. Let's start with Eli and the Starman Report to get us started. Welcome back to the Starman Report. I was out last week because I was taking my daughter on a trip to visit some family, but now I'm back and there is a lot to catch up on in the world of space, so let's jump right in. The march to the inevitable is over. And by that, I mean the inevitability that SpaceX would win out against Blue Origin in their challenge of the lunar lander contract that was awarded to Elon Musk and SpaceX. The GAO, the Government Accountability Office, rejected Blue Origin's argument that the space agency had overlooked the company's attributes, writing in a news release that it concluded that NASA did not violate the procurement law or regulation when it decided to make only one award. This means it's over. SpaceX is the sole provider for the moon lander. Before we put this to rest, we need to highlight the tactics that Blue Origin was using as part of their strategy to make their appeal. There is the following infographic on Blue Origin's website where they call the Starship immensely complex and high risk. And they go on to explain that the national team, which is Blue Origin's proposal, is safe, low risk, and fast. The cold truth is they just can't compete with SpaceX, so they're trying to gain support by shitting on them. Nice try, Blue Origin. No one's buying your narrative. Blue Origin took 20 years to get to suborbit, and SpaceX, in a fraction of the time, has already stacked the orbital Starship for its first test flight. SpaceX built and attached 29 revolutionary Raptor engines in the last couple months, while Blue Origin is four years late on delivering their BE-4 engine. The choice of who is capable of taking us to the moon and beyond is clear. What a perfect segue to what's going on with Starship at Starbase. SpaceX just completed stacking Starship on top of the super heavy booster, and it's hard to appreciate from these photos, but the rocket and booster combined comes in at just under 400 feet. That's the equivalent of a 40-story building. Unfortunately, it's really hard to appreciate how big this is until you see it in person. And if everything goes according to plan, I will actually be flying out to Starbase on Thursday of this week so I can see it in person. If you are in the Starbase area, please hit me up on Twitter at Eli Burton. I'd love to connect with you. Last but not least, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, has released his first part of his three-part video of his behind-the-scenes Starbase tour and interview with Elon Musk. I must warn you, it's definitely nerdy and Elon gets deep into the details of how he manages engineering at SpaceX, but even if it's not normally your thing, it's really worth the watch. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching this segment of the Starman Report, and back to you, Zach and Jesse. Thanks, Eli. Have a great time at Starbase. I am super jealous. Uh, maybe I could steal his Starman suit and just replace him. I mean, I have a Starman suit. Oh, right. Damn. Uh, does it fit you? 
I haven't tried it. Go check out all of Eli's great content on the Starman Report, also on his My Tesla Adventure YouTube channel, and go check out his StarmanGifts.com for a lot of cool stuff. All right, so yeah, like Eli said, if you haven't seen it yet, we urge you to watch Everyday Astronauts' amazing conversations with Elon as they walk around Starbase in Boca Chica. Elon was very much focused on Starbase this week, and we figured we'd try to cover what's on Elon's mind and what's going on there. Now, warning, we are also going to geek out a bit over what's taking place at Starbase. I believe we will look back at this time like we look back today at the Apollo missions. Movies are going to be made. People's lives are going to be inspired by what is going on right now in Boca Chica. It is truly astounding the progress that SpaceX is making. So let's check it out. Elon tweeted, Starbase is moving at warp nine. Tesla Owners Online said, Elon, how much does that part of the launch table weigh? Elon said 370 tons. And so what is that they're building there? What is that? So that is the launch stand that they're going to stack a uh, super heavy and Starship on top of. Wow. As we learned from Tim Dodd's interview with Elon, Elon has a five step process to manufacturing something. Number one, make the requirements less dumb. Number two, delete parts or processes whenever possible. Number three, simplify and optimize the design only after you have done number one and number two. Number four, accelerate the cycle time again only after one, two and three. And lastly, number five, automate. This is something that should probably be going into like engineering textbooks. Oh, my God. It should be plastered at like as you enter every engineering school in every classroom. Right. I mean, there's a lot of nuance to this, which is why it took Elon about half an hour to go through all the five points. But they're really important points when you're talking about engineering. And I think that every engineer on Earth could learn something. And about he it. gave great examples of how he learned this the hard way. Right. And he has learned this the hard way multiple times. And he even admits that he thinks that he's always not doing. <laughs> it properly right um it's a very hard process it doesn't uh, make as much logical sense as you would imagine when you're in the thick of it right yeah because you automatically think that whatever you're doing is the right thing in fact let's take this example here mm -hmm. the grid fins um on the falcon 9 the grid fins fold mm -hmm. and so you would think of course the starship will do that again and on twitter eric x says looks like non-folding grid fins on bn4 guessing this is the case for best part is no part is this accurate elon and elon said yes so what's he talking about? So the grid fins aren't going to fold up. No, no, I'm sorry. This this goes up into space, and so they have to fold out of the way. Uh, apparently, they're not going to. Uh, Elon was like, yeah, folding them requires the most parts, and it turns out they don't think they actually need to have them do that. And so he's going back to his own principles of question everything. Do they need to fold? Why do they need to fold? Right. And the interesting part here is instead of taking like four years and simulations, he's just going to try it. If it doesn't work, he'll change it. Right. I think that a lot of people think that this is like a Kerbal space program kind of uh, approach and kind of is. And it's kind of a good approach. I mean, if you've got the time and if you've got the engineering resources and you could build rockets this fast, why not? Yeah. Eric X went on to say any payload for the orbital attempt. Elon said a wheel of cheese. <laughs> What? Uh, that I believe a wheel of cheese was in their first payload to orbit. And so do you think it's like a brie and then it comes back all soft and mushy and you just can have like a, a nice brie party? I don't think it. No, it's not brie. <laughs> no? No. Will it make it back alive? I mean, Or did you just have like a melted cheese mess inside the... Uh, I mean, if something went truly wrong, it it's, it's not going to melt. It's, it's a gonna, fondue. It's, like. <laughs> no, it's going to be just carbon. <laughs> our very own Eli said, people really underappreciate how much time and mental energy that Elon puts into making our future better. He's all in and racing against the clock of his own mortality. And this is, by the way, because Elon admitted that he hadn't showered in several days uh, when he was doing the, the video with Tim Dodd. He just wanted to get this week done. And Eli said, no one knows how much time he has, but however long, it's not enough. And he knows that. Elon said, yep. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, he's not pushing like to get a good number out for the next quarter. He's right. pushing because he wants to get this done before he dies. Right. So then Michael Baylor said orbital launch tower lift is underway. So this is stacking Starship 20 onto booster four. Elon said stage zero, which is everything needed to launch and catch the rocket, is at least as hard as the booster or ship. So, so stop there for a second and realize that uh, you think it's hard to get this rocket to go up and come back down. He's saying the launching and the catching of the rocket is equally, if not harder. Right. Just the stuff that's sitting on the ground. It yeah. doesn't need to go up in the air at all. It's bolted to the ground and it's still hard to do. Alan Dale said, is there a render of how the catch of the booster will work? Elon said, we'll post once we have a decent simulation. Our first design will probably be far from the bullseye. 
And as we watched Elon and Tim talking about Starship, Elon seemed to be getting ideas on how to optimize and iterate, which is really fun because as they're talking, he's like, oh, you know, we could we could do it differently. Uh, we can see here in this Twitter exchange that Elon is always looking for ways to improve. Catboy Rocketry said everyone yelling about the grid fins like SpaceX didn't have a massive team of engineers research and design these because of clear cut benefit. Clearly, you on Twitter with a degree in Kerbal Space Program should know more than hundreds of people with degrees and hours of work and research. Elon said, indeed, grid fin designs clearly work, but do they maximize payload? Good chance that they do not. Something with much more drag to reduce terminal velocity and so reduce landing propellant might have better performance. Not sure. Potential future optimization. OK, so like he's already saying, like, maybe we won't need grid fins. Right. I think it's really cool that they're kind of putting in a big margin on this rocket so it's not just like it's just enough to get something you know into whatever we're doing it's like oh yeah there's plenty of room for improvement like we could probably also be like launching you know hundreds of satellites at a time but yeah we could we could make improvements and make it even more efficient elon was talking with tim about how they'll do all this tweaking to save a, a few pounds here and there and then come back down with falcon 9 still having a ton of of fuel left on board. And he's like, so for all the work you're trying to do to save, you know, a gram here and an ounce there, if you come back with a ton of fuel on board, who cares? So uh, he's looking at it from a bigger perspective of like, maybe we shouldn't care so much about the grid fins being so heavy and worry more about making, you know, the fuel more efficient. Right. Uh, he went on to say installing Starship booster engines for first orbital flight. And um, keep in mind, this is all last week. Right. <laughs> and uh, you can see him holding little X there and little X someday is going to have... <laughs> What an amazing story to tell. I mean, I don't think he's at the age where he's going to remember any of this, but it's, I mean. He's no, absorbing it. He's no, absorbing it. I mean, it. no children have grown up in this environment before where they're just like building a rocket in like weeks at a time. Like, Can you imagine insane. you're the you're the foreman on the job who's moving the cranes and moving. Know, and there's, there's little X and, and Marvin the dog running around. You have to be careful of. Uh, Elon tweeted this out. Raptors on super heavy. Wow. And Eric X said, Mechazilla catching super heavy. So this is a simulation that Eric X made. And Elon said, very close to real. Arms are able to move during descent to match exact booster position. Catch point is off to a side in case catch fails. Don't want to hit launch mount. Booster is transferred back to launch mount for next flight. Designed to have less than an hour turnaround. So Just hang on. Slow down. Hang on. Stop. Stop, 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 stop. So we, you know. We're kind of all a little blasé. We're all a little bored of seeing, you know, rockets come down and land on the, you know, on a drone ship, <laughs> whatever, Easy. or the ground. I mean, like, <laughs> whatever. So what SpaceX wants to do is take super heavy, a huge, massive rocket, bring it down and not just land it. They want to catch it with a tower and then turn it around so it's ready to go again in an hour. And this is why uh, when we say that you're going to be taking transcontinental flights on rockets and you're like, but how is that possible? He's figuring it out right as we speak. Everyday Astronaut went on to say, I love that you call them chopstick catching arms in the interview. This will be the craziest thing to ever see. Elon said we stole the idea from Karate Kid. Uh, Elon said super heavy booster moving to orbital launch mount. And again, this is all happening in the last same week, week last yeah. week viv said might be a silly question but why are the grid fins not evenly spaced out as they are on falcon 9 elon said pitch control requires more force than yaw and much more force than roll also grid fins closer to or in the wake of the booster are less effective however pretty good aero control can technically be achieved with only two grid fins with some effect on accuracy like he's already trying to get rid of a grid fin. Right. Elon said all six engines mounted to first orbital Starship. So the Starship is ready to go. Yeah. And if you just take a look at those rockets for a second, um, you might be like, why are there two different sizes? The ones in the middle are for atmospheric landing and the ones on the side are for in space. You want different rocket bell designs for uh, whether you're at atmosphere with high pressure um, or out in space with very low pressure. It's like winter snow tires and summer tires. No, not at all. Elon said moving rocket to orbital launch pad. Elon said Mechazilla will do this for future rockets, but it's not quite ready yet. Oh, so you have to use the <laughs> crane this time, huh? <laughs> And if you're looking at this and you're like, wow, it looks tall, but I can't really get the uh, the scale. Uh, so he said aiming to stack the ship on the booster today. So mm -hmm. that's like, how big is that? This is how big it is. And Popa Muscanity said that it is so huge. It's mind blowing. Now, I also it's not a great sense of scale because I don't know 
I haven't like been to the pyramids and I haven't seen how big they are. Elon said aiming to stack the ship on the booster today. But then he said later, winds are too high today. Looks like wind speed will be low enough to stack early tomorrow morning. TechVamp said, will this be an issue in the future with maybe better designs for high winds? Because I would imagine this is pretty important for faster launches. Elon said, once Mechazilla is operational, winds will rarely be an issue. All right. So then he tweeted out Starship fully stacked uh, and all these awesome pictures. And I wanted to ask you, Jesse, why is one side of Starship black? So those are the ablative heat tiles. But why only on one side? Uh, so like, remember the space shuttle? Oh, right. Cause it's going to come down like a belly flop. Right. And oh, right. so as it does that, that side heats up a lot. The other side doesn't as much. And you might be wondering, well, why haven't we seen these before? It hasn't gotten high enough to have to go through the atmosphere at such speeds that, that that kind of heating mitigation is going to be needed. And let's remember, this is a team effort. Elon said, an honor to work with such a great team. Michael Sheet said, how did it feel to see it fully stacked? Elon said, dream come true. So this picture was tweeted out of uh, two scale, all of these different rockets and Starship by far the tallest. Now uh, at the bottom, you could see the max payload um, Earth to orbit. Elon kind of tweeted about this. He said, over time, we might get orbital payload up to 150 tons with full reusability. And then he said, if Starship then launched as an expendable, Payload would be around 250 tons. What isn't obvious from this chart is that Starship and Super Heavy is much denser than Saturn V. So, Wait a minute, so expendable? Right. So, I mean, the Saturn V, when it went up and, you know, shot the Apollo astronauts to the moon, um, they didn't get any of it back. Oh, right, they right. They didn't come back and land and they weren't able to reuse it for, you know, Apollo oh, 12. Oh, I see. So he's saying this isn't a fair comparison because if you shot Starship up and you didn't care about getting it back, you could put much more payload in space. Because you don't have to then turn right. it around, slow it down, bring it back, land it, any of that stuff. You just go, send it, you know, right. that would be all you'd do. And Elon tweeted out, here's a picture minus the lifts. So we're seeing just kind of the stack there, which so is amazing. we're not seeing amazing. the Godzilla arms. And then Elon tweeted out this black and white photo of Starship coupling with super heavy booster. Um, and it reminds me of this famous photo of the lunch atop a skyscraper. And Elon agreed. Uh, John Carmack said, has the feel of the old building skyscraper photos. And Elon said, always love those Empire State photos with people eating lunch out on the beam. And yeah, so, yeah, I mean, this <laughs> might become the classic picture of our day. That'd be really nice. I mean, you know, because like everyone in the world has seen that photo of the uh, the guys mm -hmm. out there having lunch. And I feel like in the future, this might just be one of those photos that everyone's like, oh, yeah, I remember when they first mounted super heavy to the booster. Yeah. Like that's going to be a defining moment, I think, in human history. Yeah. Are, are they going to have lunch like out on the grid fins? They should recreate <laughs> the picture sitting on the grid fins. I'm just saying I know that'd be dangerous, <laughs> but it would be really cool. Hey, and if you want to share this with your friends, uh, all that's going on at Starbase, but you don't want to share the entire episode, we have a clips channel where we cut these down into bite-sized clips, make them much more shareable. Go check it out and subscribe. Intensive Time News is sponsored by Cybertruck Owners Club. There you'll find a crowdsource reservation tracker that you can update and find your place in line. We're about number 20, by the way. Uh, check out their website for Cybertruck news, discussions, and community for Cybertruck enthusiasts and future owners. All right, so it's time to give you an update on full self-driving beta. Um, and I think the best way to do that is with tweets that happened this week. Electric Cyber Farmer said the path planning line seems less jumpy in this build. Still not crazy about how slowly it pulls out onto 50 mile an hour roads. It needs to commit and then get on the throttle. And Elon said two weeks, actually. <laughs> so now if he says actually, like does he have to say actually multiple times for us to believe it? I don't know. So two weeks. Uh, Elon said, we are doing releases every two weeks on Friday at midnight California time. So that's helpful. Mm -hmm. That lets us know like when to look for new stuff. Holmar said the amount of issues that have been fixed between FSD beta one and FSD beta 9.1 is just mind blowing. Hope the team is very proud of themselves. Just doing my usual drives and thinking back on all the previous issues that are now completely eliminated. Elon said there's always a lot of cleanup after a major code release. Beta 9.2 will be tight. Still some fundamentals to solve for beta 10. But now that we're pure vision, progress is much faster. Radar was holding us back. Damn radar. Elon said the Tesla AI predictions are swiftly becoming superhuman. Its guesses for what it can't see well feel like ESP. It has a vastly larger training set than any human and thinks only about driving. I am getting very excited about this tweet because we've been talking about this moment 
for years. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the software was actually up to what I wanted it to mm -hmm. be or thought it could be. And now Elon's basically saying we figured out and it's getting there where the AI is now able to do more than like I can do. Like I have a bunch of experiences, mm -hmm. right? I can see like a ball go into the road and be like, I think a kid might be following the ball. Mm -hmm. That's like ESP, right? This is able to get the input from like a million drivers, mm. get all of their experiences and remember them mm. and then be able to call them up at any moment about all sorts of things, not just obvious things like balls. Tesla owners of Silicon Valley said, hey, Elon, will full self-driving beta ever go into the bike lane to make a right turn? Sometimes when making a right turn, it stays to the left of the lane while cars behind me start making right turns in the bike lane. Elon said the sheer amount of time Tesla has spent dealing with bike lane is staggering. Short answer, yes. This is really good because I am horrible with bike lanes as a driver. Like I love bikes and I love biking in the bike lane. Mm. But when I encounter bike lanes, I'm not sure like when I'm allowed to get into them and how to deal with them. And so it's great to know that like FSD is actually dealing with this problem, which hopefully should make it safer for bike riders, which is the ultimately what we want to do. Absolutely. And I think I'm not alone. I think a lot of drivers out there don't know what the bike lane like bike lanes are fairly new. Mm. Um, and so it's like we don't know how like do I never cross this line? Do I just like well, they're new and they're also an afterthought. Right. And exactly. So it's, it's just, a, you know, and they a end all of a sudden yeah, like there'll be an intersection. Then bike lane's gone. Right. And, like, yeah, it's, it, it's hard to know. Like, yeah. Can I? cross this now do i have to wait do i have to yeah what what is the etiquette and there's no like you know i went to driving school they didn't like talk about bike lanes they no just... i mean if you drive in new york for instance i mean there's lots of bike lanes now which is great but it's like how it, it's not separated like i don't know it's it's a really hard problem and i'm really glad to see they're working on it all right we've seen president biden driving a ford f-150 lightning now biden is pushing for 50 percent of all u.s passenger vehicles on the road to be electric by 2030. You know, that's why today I'm signing an executive order setting out a target of 50% of all passenger vehicles sold by 2030 will be electric. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. And the White House wants to set aside $7.5 billion from the latest $550 billion infrastructure deal towards EV charging stations. And of course, Elon gave his thumbs up. But weird that Tesla wasn't invited at this event. And yes, that's a Stellantis Jeep Rubicon. And yet Biden didn't get in a Tesla or have a Tesla behind him. And Elon agrees with you. He said, yeah, seems odd that Tesla wasn't invited. Now, we're going to talk about this more on Patreon bonus story, but I think what many of us want is to get this bigger EV tax incentive passed so that people who are in the market for a car right now know where they stand. The language in the Clean Energy for America bill that we saw from earlier this year would drop the 200,000 uh, car limit and increase the incentive to $10,000 for U.S. made EVs and $12,500 for union made EVs. And that would make a huge difference in getting people into EVs. So they, they basically want to know, all right, well, I'm not going to buy anything until I know about that. And I do, you know, when we get to the Patreon bonus story, I want to talk more about uh, Stellantis. Is that even an American company? So Oxford based company EAV or Electric Assisted Vehicles has revealed renders of its new concept modular electric urban delivery vehicle. It's called LINCS Lynx or Lightweight Inner City Solution. It's built on an aluminum chassis and is powered by two hub motors made by Sieta Group. Now, there's no battery size yet, but EAV says it will have a range of 100 miles using removable, swappable batteries. So swapping rather than sitting while waiting for a charge. Mm -hmm. The platform is modular, so the cab can go on the left or the right side and the rear can be covered open or a drop side loader. EAV says Lynx will be autonomous capable with all sensors and software. Now, I like this quote from EAV's CEO and founder, Adam Barmby. He said, it's a big culture shift step to walk away from the current legacy diesel powered vehicles on the roads. It's what we're all used to after all, and people don't like change, but that change must happen. And Lynx is a key part of the movement towards an exciting urban future transport vision. But I hear what you're asking. Has this company actually built anything? And well, yes. They have. EAV has these on the road, these electric assist e-bike van delivery things, the two cubed. Yeah, I mean, these are cute. Um, they're small and they're basically powered largely by uh, like an e-bike uh, undercarriage. Mm -hmm. um, and so while I'm super excited, I love all electric companies. I love this founder's vision. I just can't help myself be uh, reminiscent of like Arrival, mm. uh, uh, another UK based company. And it just seems like 
a lot of us get super excited when we see renders of something because we're like, oh my God, it's almost here if you've got a render of it. Um, but it has become so easy to make a render and so hard to mass produce something. And you know, even if they have a concept of it, mm -hmm. uh, like a fully built one, that's fairly easy as Elon points out. I mean, you spend a lot of time in a little factory putting together one thing, but if you want to make a lot of that one thing, uh, that's a whole other problem. So I'm a little bit optimistic and skeptical at the same time. I don't know how to put it. Right. It's, it's exciting to see, but obviously going to be keeping our eye on them. So we talk a lot about how the fossil fuel industry is fighting renewable energy and electric cars all the time. And now with a new report out from London-based watchdog group Influence Map, we have some more details to back that up. Influence Map tracks corporate influence on climate policy. Their research found 25,000 Facebook ads from just 25 oil and gas companies that launched in 2020, right after President Biden announced his $2 trillion climate plan. These ads have been seen 431 million times and cost about $10 million. Now, many of the ads contained misleading content. Now, who are the worst offenders? Exxon and the American Petroleum Institute ads made up about 62% of all the ads posted on the Facebook. So when we say that big oil and fossil fuel companies are fighting the EV revolution and the renewable energy revolution, you might be like, well, Zach and Jesse, whatever, you know, they're just doing their job. They're just uh, trying to keep their businesses alive. But no, they're actively lobbying and in this case, paying money for ads to mislead people so that when you, you know, are having a discussion with your friends on Facebook and they're like, well, I heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you heard wrong and you heard wrong because they're spending millions of dollars for you to keep hearing the wrong facts. Right. And this is really scary because people like you probably who are watching this um, probably aren't seeing those ads. Right. And so you might be saying, oh, 431 million times. That's, you know, if everyone on uh, in America was on Facebook, then I guess, you know, you'd only see a couple of them. Uh, no, it's going to be a smaller portion of the American population, and they're going to be seeing them multiple, multiple times. Right. And if you see things multiple, multiple times and uh, they're being targeted directly at you for uh, a reason because they know with analytics, they, they can they know who to pinpoint They're like th you wonder why there's such a disagreement all the time. It's because the the oil industry, 10 million dollars. Is not a lot of money for them. For, no. for them, for the oil industry, nothing. that's nothing. And they're able to influence people with that little amount of money is just mind bogglingly, staggeringly terrifying. Well, and here's the evil part. If they had to spend this money in the old days, mm -hmm. right, uh, in the 80s and 90s, let's say, and they had to put up billboards and magazine ads and TV ads that we all would see. Right. You'd be like, wait a minute, Exxon and Mobil and right. uh, American Petroleum Institute. N not fair. Right. There would be so much public pushback and outrage because, yeah, if, if there were magazine ads where they're like, oil's the way to go and, and here's a bunch of actual lies and misinformation for you to read in the magazine or up on the billboard or, you know, on TV, um, yeah, people would be going nuts. We'd be tearing down their, their corporate headquarters, we'd be dragging them out in the streets. But because we don't see any of that, and because the only thing that gets targeted to us is like, we're trying to be environmental. We're, we're greenwashing. Green. We're greenwashing you. Don't you feel better? Look at this. It's a scientist. They're thinking about it. We're Look thinking at this vial of green stuff in it. Oh, green stuff. Like, that is how they do it. It's so f***ing evil. It's so evil. And we don't even get to see it. And and it's it's. I want to thank um, Influence Map for actually doing the research and figuring this stuff out because without it we wouldn't know we'd just be like why are all these people such jerks i guess they're yep. just dumb no they're being manipulated yep. how evil is that yep so please share this over on the clips channel if you share anything this week um because yeah your, your friends who are like always fighting you and it's like where are you getting all this crap and they're just like well i heard mm -hmm. Send this to them because they are being manipulated directly. Hyundai has started offering a rental subscription service to customers who want to rent one of their electric models, the Tucson, the Kona, or the Ionic 5. Customers can now rent from three months to 24 months using Hyundai's Mosean subscription service and pay as low as 339 pounds per month. So according to Hyundai, a customer could do this whole rental process digitally using the app and the car could be delivered to them. It could be a great way to try out an EV. Now, I bet they're starting in the UK because the mileage is lower than the US. 
Yeah, the average Brit drives 7,400 miles per year versus America, where it's 13,500 miles a year. I mean, that makes sense. Uh, the British Isle is smaller. It's yeah. like the size of New Jersey. Right. No, that makes sense. And speaking of maybe renting a Hyundai Ionic 5, that leads us nicely into this story about Hyundai releasing this new charging info about the Ionic 5 as dominating, dominating Tesla. Tesla. Wow. How are they dominating, dominating Tesla? Tesla? Well, their manager of electrified powertrain development, Ryan Miller, said, if you compare us to a Tesla Model Y or an electric SUV in our segment, we're going to dominate them on miles of range added. Our ultimate goal is not competitor EVs, although you just said that, it's internal combustion engines. And to close that gap is a monumental task. We've made this huge improvement, but we still have more to do. From our perspective, we couldn't deploy the same strategy as Tesla in the long term. It wouldn't be competitive for us. We had to develop a state-of-the-art cooling system to support that. This battery has a cooling system that has what we call in-cell cooling. So the actual edge of the physical battery cells are in contact with the cooling plate. This facilitates really rapid cooling during fast charging. So wait, so according to this chart that you're showing here, the Ionic 5 can charge 10 to 80 percent in 18 minutes? Yeah, the Ionic 5 is using Hyundai's new eGIMP platform. You like that platform a lot, mm -hmm. I heard. Uh, it's an 800 volt architecture. And so by using an advanced cooling system while the battery pack charges up, Hyundai is keeping the batteries from getting cooked. I mean, look, all of this sounds great, um, except for in-cell cooling. Um, but, it, you know, it, like it, it sounds good that you can cool the battery and everything like that. I just we don't know how the battery life is going to be affected by like charging it over 100 kilowatts well beyond, you know, states of charge that are, you know, 60, 70 percent. Yeah, good point. I mean, until you have a car out basically living in the real world, you, you don't know those things. Right. Kind of like what happened to Nissan with the, you know, rapid gate. Right. Now, how much faster is this than a Tesla going to a 250 kilowatt supercharger? Um, we've seen Model 3s that charge from 10 percent to 80 percent in 28 minutes. So this would be 10 minutes faster, 10 to 80 percent. Wow. I mean, that's not nothing. 18 minutes versus 28 minutes. Yeah, that's a huge difference. Right. I mean, so hats off to Hyundai if this is true. I mean, we have not seen the car yet. Right. Um, the Ionic 5 has a targeted range of 258 to 290 miles, and we should be seeing the Ionic 5 showing up in the U.S. this fall. Now, there are some real world tests that suggest that it's going to be a lot less range than this. Yeah, we've seen some testers who got a, their hands on an Ionic 5 and drove it in real world conditions with rain and all that kind of real stuff, and it had a much lower range. Right. So we just don't know until we can test it. And it's important to note that the lower the range of the vehicle, the less miles per minute you're actually going to be getting. Um, again, we don't know yet. It's just I don't have the best feeling in my stomach about it. No, I think that uh, Hyundai tried to pull a few tricks out of their bag. They went to a higher volt architecture. Mm -hmm. A lot of brands are doing that. Um, and then they did this massive cooling. That's great. But if you uh, aren't addressing the big elephant in the room, I think, which is the battery chemistry, which is a whole lot harder to work on. Mm. Uh, not only do you have to research and develop it, but then you have to produce it at cost. So I think they're basically using existing technology and trying to squeeze as much as they can out of it. Right. But overall, I'm very happy with Hyundai's work. Um, they seem to be, I don't want to say the leader in EVs, obviously that's Tesla, but they're in some ways nipping at the heels of Tesla yeah, they're, with they're some pushing. of their designs. And that's great because, I mean, if you nip at the heels of Tesla, you're going to just push Elon to run faster. Yes. All right, it's time for Into the Future. Into the future. Actually, uh, no, this is going to be a trip down memory lane. In the future. Well, uh, okay. So remember this genius, Mark B. Spiegel, the managing member of Stanfield Capital Management? Uh, yes. Yes, I do remember him. Well, he wrote this back on September 17th, 2014. Quote, conclusion, even if Tesla were able to grow as quickly as Microsoft did in its prime, an absurd scenario for a non-monopolistic, non-software company, it would produce only 186,000 cars in 2020. And, um, oh, I I'm sorry. What was that you were asking, dear viewer? How many cars did Tesla sell in 2020? Ah, uh, well, let me see here. Uh, I don't know. I have the chart somewhere. Ah, uh, yes, here it is. Why, that looks like Tesla sold half a million cars in 2020. But Mark Spiegel said, no complex product manufacturer has ever grown that quickly from a revenue base of $3 billion or more. And uh, let's just point out that he bet against Tesla mm -hmm. with uh, the, the millions and millions of dollars. Oh, he shorted he, it, yep. And... Um, it didn't go too well for him. No. No. And so, yeah, someone on Twitter pointed out this quote that basically it was going to be impossible for, for Tesla to do what they did. And Elon responded and he said it was difficult. So 
And I just love this because uh, for years we have been reporting about all this FUD, all of these shorts who are like, it's impossible. You guys are lying. These companies are full of crap. Uh, and now we actually have done it. All the things that they said were printed for the whole world to see. Mm -hmm. And now we can go back and say, we told you so. You were wrong. And it's and it's fine to doubt. It's fine to be like, I don't know if this company, but to be so adamant at each step as they're as they're showing that it can be done and that they're a different kind of company to be so adamant that they're just lying to you. Well, and not only doing that, but betting not only against the company, but hurting the company, hurting the shareholders of that company by shorting millions and billions of dollars against Tesla um, when the, the whole goal of Tesla is a pretty positive mm -hmm. one. It wasn't just to, you know, cut down a rainforest. It was to protect produce electric vehicles, which could someday save those rainforests or the oceans or, uh, you know, your grandchildren from massive floods and hurricanes and awful things. That is just not very cool. Uh, and so, yeah, that's like the take, nicest way take to take that it. Mark Spiegel. <laughs> um, I mean, it I mean, screw him. Hurt him financially more than any words I can say or yeah. do. All right. It's time for Going Green. And we are sponsored by EcoWare. If you're looking for a great gift for someone or yourself, we carbon offset the manufacturing, the shipping and the life cycle of your purchase. We plant 10 trees for every purchase and... We help cap a well with the Well Done Foundation. So go over to ecoware.us and check out all the cool Tesla and SpaceX designs that we have, including handmade solar powered mugs. Yeah. Planning a trip with Airbnb just got a lot easier for EV drivers. Airbnb now lets you search for accommodations with EV chargers. Yeah, I mean, anyone who has used Airbnb to search for a place to stay has used their filters. Do we want a hot tub or free parking or pool or gym? And now do we want an EV charger? So we searched the UK, for instance, and we found over 100 accommodations that offer EV charging. Yeah, I did a search of the United States and I turned up over 90 places. So weird that the UK is the size of New Jersey and had over 100 places, but Whatever. still good. Um, Airbnb has partnered with Tesla and Solar City in the past to get Tesla chargers and solar panels installed at host houses. Um, so if you're an Airbnb host, maybe look into that and increase your home's value. And by the way, the EV charger filter is under the facilities filter section. So I mean, that's good to know. Another thing to note, if you are like seriously looking on Airbnb, is that maybe they don't have an EV charger, but maybe they have a plug that you could plug an extension cord into. Um, talk to your hosts about it in case they get mad at the electrical <laughs> bill. <laughs> All right, it's time for sunspots. So Luxembourg-based startup Mana Electric and its CEO, Joost van Orschot, want to take sand and the sun and turn them into solar panels using these self-contained factories called TerraBox. They say it could be used on the moon or Mars, and a byproduct is oxygen, which astronauts could breathe. Yeah. Von Orschut says, we call ourselves the utility company of the solar system. So that is very... Uh like video gamey kind of yeah feeling. now i have not researched this or backed it up <laughs> i'm reaching out to the company to find out more uh, it does sound a little too good to be true but i mean you know I, it's possible that there's robots in there uh right because i mean solar panels aren't just made of sand there there's other stuff in there sure. but you could load it up with the other stuff too yeah i mean it's cool. It's very cool. It's very, you just I turn a desert more. into solar and then you could run the world off of it. And, and I just want to point out, like, this sounds crazy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and you might dismiss it. But a lot of ideas sound crazy until you can make them happen. And this is how we move forward. So, uh, until, you know, until we know more, let's stay optimistic. Yeah. And if you'd like to put solar on the roof of your house, it's not even as complicated as TerraBox. But there are lots of questions. So you can talk to our friends at Energy Pal. They have tons of answers because no matter how much you think, you know, mm. uh, there's always tax questions and there's always like up to the minute things that are changing. Energy Pal knows all this stuff and uh, they'll do it for you for free. So check out the link down below and tell them that Zach and Jesse sent you. All right, it's time for our video contributor stories. Before we do ours this week, I want to remind you guys, you can send us your video contributor stories. Shoot them in landscape, two minutes or less. Don't put any music in there and send them to hello at now you know channel .com and maybe you'll get yours on the air. What do we got this week, Jess? We've got our buddy Bill in Tennessee. Hey everyone, this is Bill from Linden, Tennessee. I want to do a, a little video showing some results that I came up with, some pretty shocking, alarming results that I came up with. So I've done some videos on my YouTube page about this uh, electric lawnmower that I converted. I did this original conversion about four years ago, three or four years ago, and I converted the electric, the gasoline riding lawnmower, the Murray there, uh, just to electric, so that the electric, a single electric motor was running 
the deck and the tractor and and that was it um, and then eventually I altered that because it was kind of a rotten lawnmower and just made it an electric tractor I moved the electric motor from where it was in the engine compartment to uh, back here just directly driving the transmission um, that did a few things for me it gave me a little bit of efficiency because I'm not transmitting power through drive belts uh, but it also made it much much faster uh, this little dude does almost 30 miles an hour it's kind of obscene um, but then I was without a lawnmower so I got a hold of some old cub cadet riding lawnmowers from the 70s and I think one of them from the 60s that's my next project uh, after the Jeep's done and got the mower deck off of it it was in really really good shape no rust at all 48 inch mower deck and took the uh, took an electric motor 48 volt uh, DC brushed electric motor I think it's 5 horsepower continuous and 15 peak uh, but I've just got it running directly off of the same traction uh, battery pack that's on the, the tractor there so um, basically it's just a switch under the seat you flip the switch and it makes the lawnmower work it's got some belts and that's all there is to it so but the purpose of this video is not to talk about this lawnmower uh, other than the fact that it's electric now my yard is just about an acre um, and it takes this lawnmower pulling pulling that trailer around it takes it an hour it takes it one hour to do it and I had got a hold of uh, a friend of mine's mm, gasoline tractor, this Husqvarna here, 24 horse, or is it 27 horse, Husqvarna 42 inch, uh, 44 inch, 48 inch also uh, riding lawnmower. And it didn't run, but I made it run. And I thought it'd be a cool idea just to um, fill up the fuel tank to full, cut the grass, see how long it took, and then see how much gasoline it took. Well, turns out it took the exact same one hour to cut the my yard as the electric tractor does and it used one gallon of gasoline i know that because i filled it up uh to the line right there and whenever i was finished i came back and uh poured some gasoline into a gallon jug and poured that into the fuel tank and lo and behold it was almost exactly one gallon one gallon if you didn't know is about 34 some people say 37 kilowatt hours worth of energy to do the same yard in the same amount of time it takes 2.5 kilowatt hours of battery energy and all that's coming from two Chevy Volt with a V Victor if you're military Chevy Volt modules they come out of the entire Chevy pack that's 16 kilowatt hours but this is just two modules each of these modules are about uh, you know one and a half or so kilowatt hours um, and I've just got them running parallel that's kind of alarming to me because two and a half kilowatt hours is one sixteenth of the energy as a gallon of gasoline said a different way that lawnmower over there uses 16 times more energy to do the same amount of work as this does say it another way I could cut my grass 16 times basically an entire summer on one gallon of gasoline there you go that was just a uh, shocking to me I didn't I knew it was gonna be different uh, this here little smart car this is electric also and it gets about four times better efficiency than uh, the same uh, gasoline powered smart car if you look at a you know gasoline equivalent energy comparison but the lawnmower gets 16 times one other cool thing a oh, Ford yeah just came out with their truck and they're talking about how you can uh, run your house off of your truck off to the engine off of the traction pack in your truck well I've got a 48 volt uh, 2000 watt inverter on this tractor so all I have to do is just plug the inverter to that uh, little connector right there and I could actually run a few things in the house if I wanted to uh, but this is really handy because I can go drive around the, the you know the place and run a power saw or uh, any other electrical equipment anyway I digress so I thought you might enjoy that and I uh, thought it was some interesting findings thanks for watching wait he built that he built that that's awesome that it's so awesome um I Bill I gotta hand it to you man that's freaking cool yeah um uh 
please head over to Bill's YouTube channel so that way you could maybe ask him how he did it. Or And if uh, you want to know more, I mean, we have a, a whole series that we did on a lawnmower conversion where we talk about the basics of how to do it. So if you need some pointers and tips, we, we you got, you know, we got your back. Yeah. Uh, Bill seems a little more advanced. Sure. Than I us. would we, probably <laughs> talk to Bill first. Yes. Uh, that was really cool. <laughs> All right. It's time for our Patreon bonus stories this week. Was Tesla sabotaged? Another Tesla driver asleep at the wheel and, and more. more. Uh, <laughs> Wow. And also for our Investor Club members, we have a bonus story as well about Arrival. So if you want to check that out, go to our patreon.com slash now, you know, support us for as little as a buck a month and you'll get to check that out. All right, we are back from the Patreon bonus stories. That was really satisfying. It's time for our shout outs. These are people who support us for $5 or more every month. Who do we got this week, Jess? We've got Adia. Vlad Serbu. Sarah Irons Baker. Daniel Morrissey, Jason Mugo, Nicholas Veith, Justin Carlson, Charles McGill, Victor Case Sati, Michael Ratka, Chris Babcock, Christopher Ciccone, SDR, Anton Strunk, The Bigger Boat, Mike Gossard, Scott Kisser, Kim Polly Mortensen, Kevin Patch, Chike Mamali, Alejandro Wilcox, Greg Corbo, Roland Schuster, and Meet Snowmaker. Thank you so much for supporting us. We can't do this show without you. All right, it's time for Elon's Tweets of the Week. And WDW Streetlight Speaker said, What sort of computer do you use, by the way? Always wondered if you had a massive custom-built machine or preferred a more contemporary sleek workstation. Elon said, PC desktop with latest graphics card, although I have a Mac 2 gigabyte laptop. So he's got, that's at least three computers. <laughs> John Carmack said, old programmers instinctively recognize powers of two, but a younger generation of higher level programmers often don't. I was pleasantly surprised when my young son was considering 16 and 32 neat numbers. It was due to Minecraft. Casey Murituri said, this happened to me in real life. Some programmers at lunch wondered if everyone only had one child, how long would it take for humanity to just be one person left? I instinctively said about 33 generations, depending on how you count it. They had no idea how I did that. Elon said, replacement rate is 2.1, so roughly 31 generations, but let's try to avoid this. And then Elon shared this video of the Neuralink company bar. So that's a great way to recruit people. Yeah, uh, Toby Lee said, this bar looks exactly like Cyberpunk 2077 brain dance bar. Ha ha. Elon said, it's inspired by Cyberpunk. Massimo said, meet the Bionic Opter, a robotic dragonfly that masters the highly complex flight characteristics of insects. Elon said, first birds weren't real, now bugs aren't real either. John Ehrlichman said, on this day in 2008, SpaceX suffered its third straight rocket launch failure. Elon Musk told staff, I will never give up, and I mean never. Elon said, 2008 was an extremely tough year on every level. Renata said, you vowed to reach orbit with this quote before the fourth Falcon 1 launch. Fate liked SpaceX that day, and the launch was successful. Optimism, pessimism, f*** that. We're going to make it happen. As God is my bloody witness, I'm hell-bent on making it work. Elon said I was asked by a reporter if I was optimistic or pessimistic about SpaceX's future. That was my answer. Teslarati said Tesla's master plan turns 15 years old. And Elon said, Hard to believe it's been 15 years already. Those goals actually precede the creation of Tesla by many years. It goes back to probably 1992 when I was in college. However, at the time, I thought the chance of achieving those goals was very low. Stem says this map shows the surface area that we would need to power the world, the EU, or Germany solely through solar power. Elon said that's about right. Civilization can be powered with a very small percentage of Earth having solar panels. Pernay says surface of Mars captured by Curiosity rover. It's mind-blowing. I'm looking at another planet millions of miles away in space. I'm looking at the surface of a planet people only managed to peak a few hundred years ago. This world is tiny compared to what's out there. Elon said Mars looks amazing. Tesla owners of Silicon Valley said NASA called Elon and told them they had won the $1.5 billion contract. Elon's response, I love you guys. Elon said it's true. I do love NASA, always have. Just want to say thanks to those in government who fight hard for the right thing to happen, despite extreme pressure to do otherwise. Therein lies the core goodness of the American state. If you said that that quote came from like Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> I think people would be like, yep, up, that checks out. Tesla owners of Silicon Valley said, what were you most shocked about with NASA calling you? Elon said, I thought we had lost for sure. We were just a tiny company back then. Only one of four launches got to orbit and I had no money left. Out of the blue, a few days before Christmas, NASA calls to say we won. Austin Tesla Club says, quote, the goal of SpaceX is to really build the technologies necessary to make life multiplanetary. This is the first time in the four billion year history of Earth that it's possible for life to become multiplanetary. And that's a quote from Elon. 
Elon said, that is the goal. Our official name is actually Space Exploration Technologies. SpaceX is short form. Elon went on to say, if you're curious about Tesla, SpaceX, and my general goings on, Walter Isaacson is writing a biography. And Lex said, now that is the right guy for the job. His biographies are some of the greatest books ever written, in my opinion. Elon said, yeah, they're all good, but I particularly liked his biography of Ben Franklin. Oh, so maybe that's why the quote <laughs> sounded so familiar. Josh Bickett said, perfect. He does a great job. Assume that means you're no longer writing your own? Elon said, maybe one day. Tesla owners of Silicon Valley said, how much time are you spending with Walter Isaacson? Elon said he shadowed me for several days so far. Austin said Elon was booster four and ship 20 chosen to be the first pair to be stacked because of their meme potential. Or was it a stroke of fate loves irony? Elon said total coincidence. Also, booster height was originally 70 meters, but we eliminated a half barrel for manufacturing efficiency. So now <laughs> it's... Alex said, starting with Plaid, Tesla pioneered in-house direct wound manufacturing system that delivers next level performance and efficiency. Highly specialized companies agree carbon sleeve rotors are the future, but they still can't keep up with Tesla's pace of innovation. Elon said Tesla Automation Deutschland built a specialized machine to wrap the rotor with carbon fiber at precise tension. If too low, it would come loose at low temperature due to CTE differences. If too high, it would snap at high temperature and RPM. All right, so I guess buying Tesla Groom and Automation was a smart idea. It was a smart idea and... It really shows how far ahead Tesla is because the leaders are like, yeah, if we could do carbon fiber wrapped uh, rotors, we would. And Tesla is the <laughs> one doing it. The only company that doing it. Ivan said, Elon, with the advancement of AI and such a large fleet collecting data, will Tesla ever overtake Waze by auto collecting data such as construction zones or potholes and bad roads and automatically route away from those roads via self-driving without the owner ever knowing? Elon said, probably. Oh, man. Yeah. Jonathan says, I think what we'd appreciate, Elon, is another of your presentations on where you think Starship is right now and how you see things developing. There's an IAC Congress in October. You've performed there before. What about another turn? Elon said, OK. Although I think uh, his everyday astronaut appearances are just as good. Yeah, stellar. Tesla owners of Silicon Valley says this is the first time in the four billion year history of Earth that it's possible for life to become multiplanetary. Elon said long time. All right. So we had a poll. Very important poll. The question was, is the $25,000 Tesla coming? Oh, and just to point out, our patrons are usually right. So what do they say? Um, most people said on its way, sure. End of this year? No, maybe next year. Interesting. Um, but the second longest was that it's a long way off. The Tesla still has to make the Cybertruck, the Semi, and the Roadster. Um, and But some people thought that maybe Ray for Tesla was right and that they were going to begin production by the end of this year. Hmm. Okay, well, my money's going on next year then. All right, it's time for Community Mail Time. Community Mail Time. And uh, Jasper in the Netherlands just got this email from Tesla saying that the Model Y is there to see in the Netherlands at the Amsterdam Southeast showroom. Happened on the 31st of July. So no test drives, but still a message that it should arrive in 2021. That's really good. Uh, Rafi sent us this video showing the right hand steering Model Ys that they just released in Hong Kong. They should be available at the end of September or early October. Go check out his YouTube channel called Clueless Dad. And I'm a clueless dad. I don't think you're clueless. <laughs> Uh, Jared sent us this video of something he found in the wild. Hey, Zach and Jesse, this is Jared coming from you from Chandler, Arizona. Today has been a pretty hot day, kind of miserable, but something caught my eye today. Two F-150 Lightnings. And what caught my eye about the vehicles was that the grill. <laughs> and then the one on top, you know, with the light bar on top. And then the one on the bottom without the light bar on top. I will show you inside, but the way the sun is glaring, you really can't see inside. Um, I prefer not to throw my face because I don't want no repercussions behind this. And then also, here in the back of the truck, I don't know if you can see, there's no exhaust. But there's also no badge saying, you know, lightning or anything on there. And I'm not sure this one does also doesn't have a, a light bar on the back of it. You know, how it's supposed to go around the whole back. It's the same as this one also. And so I can't really see inside. And then also one more thing. The charge port. And then also on the bottom, you can probably see the 
battery packs. Now you know. Are those F-150 Lightnings? They are. Oh. Uh, yeah. That's, I mean, there's no, there's no tailpipe, so they that's exciting either that or they have no engines i don't wow. know mark sent us these pictures of the nissan aria he saw in greenboro north carolina hmm. i wonder if the wind just blew that off or if uh, maybe he tugged it off i'm sure it's the, just the wind <laughs> thank you mark uh and luke spotted an aria too uh he said hey zach and jesse spied this quasi camouflage nissan aria charging here in st charles missouri car had michigan manufacturer plates all vehicle badging was covered with tape and the dashboard partially covered Awesome that we got our spies out there reporting. Yes. This is really cool to see. So, I mean, the Aria, it's real-ish. I mean, I didn't think it wasn't real. I just, <laughs> you know, it's been a long time coming. Uh, look what Christopher found in East London. Elon! <laughs> Elon! <laughs> That's great. Uh, and then be careful what you asked for, Jesse. Do you remember what you asked for last week? Yes. Uh, different colored Teslas. That's okay. all I wanted. Well, that's all you got. Corey says, here's a photo of my Tesla and a few others in Alberta, Canada. Shout out to the Tesla Owners Club of Alberta. We have two orange Model 3s, an orange Roadster, and a sick copper wrap Model X. Nice. How about this one? Dave sent us his photo of a gold Model 3 in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, Jose sent us these photos and a video of a turquoise Model S. Have we covered all your colors yet? No. Oh, we haven't? Okay. Catrice sent us these photos of her beautiful orange Model S. I haven't seen that color before. That's beautiful. How about this? Han sent us a photo of this multicolored Model Ooh. 3 at the North Vancouver, British Columbia uh, in Canada. And uh, yeah, so just be careful what you ask for. I mean, we're still missing some colors. We definitely oh, got... Oh, don't we, do that. We no. got orange covered squarely. I'm just saying we're missing a couple. Oh, I don't have any purple. All right. They're coming I in. Any, I didn't get any greens. All right. They're coming. So, look, I mean, you're just, I'm just saying. But then Dave said, hey, Zach and Jesse, huge fan here. Been watching you guys religiously for the past four years. Why didn't I buy Tesla stock? Yeah, why didn't you? <laughs> My wife and I were wine tasting yesterday at Fazelli Winery in Temecula, California. And lo and behold... There's a Rivian in the parking lot. It was a bit larger than I expected. It was pretty beat up as it looks like it had been going off-roading a lot. Keep up what you guys are doing. All right, enough of the R1T yeah, wh videos. Who, who gets to do this? Oh, man. Oh, and um, just, to, just in case that wasn't enough salt in your wounds, uh, Sean spotted this Rivian in Orange County at the REI camping store in Tustin, California. So yeah, they're they're around. I don't know why we don't have one yet, but maybe to take some of the sting off of it, uh, it looks like the Cybertruck is going to be late too. What? I thought Tesla was going to build a few before the end of the year and we were going to get a Cybertruck Christmas present. Not according to the Cybertruck order page. Wait, so I'm not getting my Rivian or my Cybertruck for till next year? Apparently not. So uh, the, the pickup truck EV revolution is going to have to wait a year. I could still get my Rivian this year. It's possible. They said September. They said <laughs> September. Um, RJ, come on. Yeah, deliver. I, 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 please. All right. It's time for supercharger reviews. And Carl hit us up with a future supercharger update at Dodenhof in northern Germany. That should be opening in a few weeks. Hi, Zach and Jesse. Here's Carl Owen from Germany. I'm at Dodenhof, that's between Hanover, Bremen and uh, Hamburg on between the A27 and the A2 and what have we got here? We've got Dodenhof of course where you can get a lot of snacks and buy a lot of stuff from everything you want and look on this side it's new Tesla Superstore with 250 kilowatt superchargers it's a 12 store and they're just building it and getting it ready. I think it'll be open in the next two or three weeks. So that was Carl speaking from Germany. And I'll give this an eight out of 10 because it's not open on a Sunday. The superchargers are, but not the, not the shop. So that's it. See you then. Now you know. That's exciting. Thank you, Carl. All right, well, let's check out the rest of our supercharger reviews. All right. I'm here at Rugby Services on the M1. Junction 1 uh, in the United Kingdom and we have a brand new service centre uh, it has 12 Tesla chargers as you can see here and um, it's also got 12 chargers for uh, the electric highway which has been put in partly funded by Ecotricity and partly funded by another company whose name I can't remember and I'm sure I can edit that bit in the afterwards uh, Grid serve, that's it Good old grid serve 
So the grid surcharges with a nice big screen on them. Very nicely, it shows you how many kilowatts you're pulling and how many amps and volts. Why don't more chargers do that? <coughs> and the electric highway ones are currently on free vend for the week. So I was plugged into a Tesla charger, discovered it was free vend on the other one, so I moved. Anyway, now you know. Hi, Zach and Jesse, Soleil here, and I'm at the Rick's Cafe and Boatyard 3 stall Tesla destination charger. They are 16 kilowatts. We are just here on Eagle Creek Reservoir, just outside Indianapolis. They are real easy to get to. They are just off the main road. Great parking. Nobody charging here right now. I will charge a Cybertruck when I do have one. The views here are pretty good. Rick's Cafe has good food and is much what you want to do here with the destination charger. There's a dam just over on the side here. Food is good and if I were to give this place a rating with the three stalls, the one off-brand right here, and at 16, I would give this place a 9 out of 10. Now you know. Hi everybody, Mike from the Rural Montana family. I'm here in Helena, Montana to bring you a Tesla destination charger review. I'm here at Sats Hot Famous Chicken. This is a restaurant, bar and casino and it is kids friendly. It's a relatively small place. So there's an Arctic entry, two doors. And here we are. This is their dining room. Really cozy dining room, there's the bar. As you walk back here, you will get to the casino in here. That's where you keep your kids out. And then here, these are the bathrooms, and I hope you pick the right one that you know which one to go to. There is uh, two Tesla chargers here. There's 13 kilowatts each. And then there's a Clipper Creek here which I believe is a 32 amp charger. So you could also use uh, the Clipper Creek with your Tesla, just use the provided adapter from Tesla. Currently there's a Chevy Bolt charging here and uh, no Teslas here. So this is a really super great place. Um, great food, been here several times eating and uh, I rate this place a 10 out of 10. If you're in Helena, Montana, you want to charge here, you want to eat here. 10 out of 10. Now you know. Hey, Zach and Jesse. I'm at the Tesla Supercharger location at the Shonan Terrace Mall in Fujisawa City, Japan. These superchargers are located on the rooftop of the parking garage in Section A. There are two superchargers in this location as well as three non-Tesla regular chargers. Near the superchargers is an escalator that'll take you down into the mall. It's a pretty big mall, so there are plenty of bathrooms, shops, and restaurants. It also has a nice terrace area. Being located at a mall, this supercharger location is really convenient but I'll have to knock a few points off for having only two stalls. I give it a 7 out of 10. Now you know. Nice. All of those were actually built. Nice. <laughs> nice. So um, cool to see them. Thank you for sending them in. And you know how to get them in, right? You go to our website, uh, nowyouknowchannel.com, the Supercharger Reviews page, and you can just load them in right there, and then we'll get them and put them on the show. And you can view them right there, too, I know. so if you're going on a road trip. Um, there are new superchargers in the world, though. What do we got? Uh, we've got the 12-stall version 3 in Tilburg, Netherlands. we got number 35 in the Netherlands, the 12-stall version 3 in Sassenheim, Netherlands. Number 34 in Hong Kong is the 6-stall version 3 at Oiman, Hong Kong. Number 54 in New York is the 12-stall version 3 in Lake Grove, New York. Number 101 in Germany, the 12-stall version 3 at Plauen, Germany. Number 5 in Israel is the 8-stall 250 kilowatt in Afula, Israel. Number 233 in California, the 20-stall version 3 in San Gabriel. 
Number 38 in Pennsylvania, the four-stall version 3 in Mansfield, Pennsylvania. Number 38 in New Jersey, number 1,107 in the United States. Number 2,890 in the world is the eight-stall version 3 at Mount Laurel, James Fenimore, New Jersey. And it's time for the Patreon giveaway. And to get into this big barrel of fun, you support us on Patreon. The more you support us, the more chances you have to win, which is a $30 gift card to EcoWare. Um, and uh, who's our winner this week? The winner is Michael Valicella. Congratulations to Michael. You're getting a $30 gift card where we carbon offset the manufacturing, the life cycle, and the shipping of your product. Uh, there's a lot of cool designs. One truck to rule them all. Giga <laughs> Uh, this does come in a, uh, a tank top, I believe. So. Ooh, yeah. Where There's did the gym? Because I know I don't deserve to wear, but if you do, maybe have a giga press speaking, shirt while you're speaking pressing. Speaking of uh, pressing and looking good on the uh-huh. beach, you're heading to sunny California. I'm I heard. headed to sunny California. Uh, that's going to be in uh, less than two weeks. So if if you're in California, if you want to say hi, if you work at SpaceX and you want to give me a tour, if you work at. <laughs> Tesla and you want to give me a tour um I'm just it uh I'm on you'll, vacation you'll fit it in I'm on right? actual vacation uh so you can hit me up on Twitter I just I just made my first Twitter account really uh you can hit me up at jcat mcfly <laughs> so uh that's jcat mcfly if you want to uh hang out uh, I we're not renting a Tesla in what? Uh, California. We could get one. What? So uh, I appreciate it. I'm with my uh, my girlfriend's family. So um, they would appreciate a ride. Maybe in a plaid. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'd love. Don't just, ask for much. I just <laughs> anything you guys, you know. What I, part of California are you going to? Um, I'll be in San Diego and L.A. So if you're in that area or you want to come visit, um, I can't promise that I'll be able to see everyone. But, yeah, hit me up on Twitter at Jcat McFly. Nice. So. So what am I going to do? Do I have to stay here and do the show? Yeah. I'm going to have to call up Steven and yeah, have him Steven's come back. He's going to have to help again. All right. All right. Steven well, really stepping up. He I did. He's appreciate rocking. it. He did a great job on on uh, the show where I, again, was out. Yeah. And, um, this is the only this is the last vacation I have planned for the summer. Forever. This one, listen. This vacation was supposed to happen last year. Right. Obviously, it couldn't have happened. Um. So yeah, yeah. you deserve a vacation. You Thank deserve you. two vacations. Well, you deserve as many as you want. Uh. No, I think I just deserve two. Uh. This will be the last one. Um. And uh, at least for this summer. And uh, yeah. So. That's great. Thank, thank you again for Stephen for stepping up, and thank you for watching the show. Um. You know the people. Uh, scrolling by here, there, or there. <laughs> yes, they're, they're over there. I don't see it. I can't see outside of this box. So you could be doing, you make all sorts of faces at me and I wouldn't see you. Um, the, the people who are supporting the show make it possible for yeah. us to do the show every week. Um, and, you know, you might be like wondering like, oh, they do oh, sponsorships. It's because uh, we have a big team. Yeah. We do have a really big team of editors um, and and people working on the show. As soon as we're done recording this, like we're about to hit stop. I have the remote, which will stop the recording. We have to pull the cards out of the camera. We have to like, it's not the next day or anything. We're literally going to start editing it within minutes of us finishing recording. And that is how you get this show. Yeah, they work on it constantly for hours and hours. The minute, so the minute it goes live, right. you've just seen hours and hours of work. If you're watching this on Monday, you're literally, it, it, it's only been a couple hours since we've recorded this. And this is a more than an hour long show. Right. Um, not to mention uh, Patreon bonus stories. Right. It's a staggering amount of work. This show does not happen. Uh, Zach and I can, could not possibly go and edit this show. Our brains are fried. Right. Um, we cannot do anything else. Yeah. Uh, the every, rest of the day, we're usually every just... Every Sunday, I just go home <laughs> and I just... my I'm peanut butter. <laughs> I'm not useful uh, at all because I've poured everything into the show. So that's where our editors come in. We have to pay them. Obviously, they need to live and you know uh, enjoy their lives. So... Um, Thank you to everyone who supports this. If you watch this show, if you've seen this show, if this is your first show, please consider hitting the subscribe button, hitting the notification bell. And the like button. And the like button. You don't have to hit the notification bell, by the way. Just the subscribe button would mean a lot to me. Um, the like button helps a lot. It, it like messes with the algorithm and lets more people see it. Um, so, yeah, anything that you could do would be wildly appreciated. We'll see you next week. Now, now you know. know.